I'll see you yeah. after. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I'll for be sure. Right here. Okay, good. Thanks. Hey guys, how you doing? Yeah? It's been amazing to walk around and see what you guys are building. This is incredible. So I want to thank you for having me. Um, it's my first time to Brazil. So it's been a good couple days getting to see the country a little bit. Um, I want to share my story of how we started, um, why we do what we do, how we began, and I think the sort of implications that it has for all of you here in Brazil who want to be programmers or work in robotics or work in software or hardware or all of these things. Obviously what we do is very different than what's being done here, but I think that there's huge connections between the two and a lot of implications for how we could work together to solve the world's problems um, or solve some of our greatest challenges. First I want to sort of tell you a story about how I got started. Um, how, how old are most of the people in this room? Are you guys, let's say, are you 18 to 22? Is the translating word 18 to 22? Okay, all right. What about 22 to 26? Okay, and 26 to 30? All right, so when I got started, the photo I'm about to show you, I was 25. Um, I didn't know much about anything. I just knew that I wanted to see the world, that I wanted to explore and hear new sounds and smell new smells and hear new stories about what was going on. I knew that the version of the world that I had learned in my home was a very small version and that there were other stories out there of what the world was like. And so this is, um, this is my first day on the African continent. Um, and I share this picture because I think what this picture says is cocky little punk. Um, you know, arrogant, brash, thinks he knows everything about everything, um, thinks he knows how to change everything and the solution to what's going on in the world. But really, you don't know anything, right? You're just starting. You're, like, you're just learning. Um, and so with this adventure, I just decided to get as lost as I could possibly get. Um, I stuck my thumb out, I had a backpack, and I began hitchhiking. I got lost, and I got lost, and ended up in places I never imagined that I would. Um, got as lost as I could possibly get. And after three months of journeying, I ended up in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I don't know if you guys know much about Congo, but Congo actually is very similar history to Brazil in so many ways. Congo's a massive country. It's absolutely beautiful. It's home to the second largest rainforest in the world. The only rainforest that's larger than the one in Congo is the one that's here in Brazil. You know, the original colonies in Congo were entirely about rubber, which is very similar to what's happened, what happened in Brazil. There was mass pillaging and conquering for rubber and then for diamonds and then for gold and for so much else. Pillaging of the resources and pillaging the people. Um, but of course, I knew none of this when I walked in. All I knew is that people talked about this great big land called Congo, and I was there to explore. And what we found was war. You know, this is a van that had been exploded by a rock-pelled grenade. Um, and as we journeyed in on the fifth day, we found a military encampment that was torturing children. It was treating them as enemies of the state. Now these kids, you know, you have all heard the stories of child soldiers. This is nothing new, right? These kids had been abducted, they had been forced to kill, they had been forced to force other boys to kill. But these five were among the clever ones. They had escaped the rebel armies and they had fled to the national army for refuge. And the national army was then treating them like enemies of the state, treating them like war criminals. And so, we sat down with them um, and we spent the next few hours swapping stories. You know, they would listen to us and we would listen to them. And look, our lives could not be more different, right? I grew up in California, spent 10 years in Texas. Uh, I had worked for a billionaire entrepreneur, had traveled the world, was sort of just on an adventure. And these kids had been born in the jungle. They had been forced to kill by eight forced to force other boys to kill by nine, they had escaped at 10, and at 11 years old were being beaten for these war crimes. So our lives were very, very different. But as you're sitting there sharing stories, it's like, you know, we feel hunger the same way. We feel thirst the same way. We laughed at the same jokes. 
Except just like right now, there's a little delay because of the translator. You know, we missed our families the same way. Um, I'd been away from my mom and dad for four months. They'd been away from theirs for four years. And so the differences were very real, but those commonalities were very significant. And they were significant because we were sharing stories with one another, stories about our lives. And I think that what you guys are doing here is you create the games and you create the interactions. You create the ways that the world can talk to one another and that young people can communicate across the planet. Ultimately, what you're doing is storytelling, right? You're providing a mechanism for us to tell stories. There was a speaker that was here last night and he said that games reflect the designer's view of the world. They reflect their understanding of reality and their biases towards that reality. The same is true of our stories and of the platforms that allow us to share them. And when I look in this room, I think about the next generation of people who are going to create those platforms, create the ways that we can share stories with one another. For me, it was sitting in a military encampment with children who were war criminals. So often, the way that we've stayed in touch with them has been across the internet. And this will be the way that we stay in touch with one another after tonight. One of the boys in this military encampment, they told us that the kids who were too small to carry a gun, that they had been sent to the front lines of war armed with only a whistle, that they had been sent out as human shields. And they would use this whistle late at night to scare away the enemy. And then if they didn't scare away the enemy, failing that, they were supposed to receive the bullets with their bodies and in falling, create a blockade for other soldiers to hide behind. You know, we had never heard anything like this. And we ended up working with the UN to get the boys pulled out. Ultimately, the encampment got shut down. And I went home that night and just chugging down red wine and punching holes through walls and screaming at the moon, wrote a stupid little blog. The blog was called Falling Whistles. This was the view that night. Not that's dissimilar to the view that you see outside here. I sent the blog out to about 80 friends and family, a very small group of best friends and family and people that I loved and I trusted. And they read it and they forwarded it around the world. They forwarded it and forwarded it and forwarded it and forwarded it. And I woke up the next day to hundreds of emails and then thousands of emails saying, what do we do? How do we help? Why is this happening? What's going on? And it was like, <laughs> I have no idea, right? I just got here. I don't know anything. But because the blog had gone out through the internet and it had gone out through the social network, thousands and thousands of people were reading about it and writing back. And so we just decided to figure it out to figure out what was going on. So we, make fa we made fake press passes, um, saddled up, and we went out. We went out, and we went out. And what we found was a gorgeous country, as beautiful as anywhere I'd ever seen. Women who wore miraculous colors, oranges and purples and yellows and greens. Men who wore meticulous suits. You know, they might be among the poorest people on the planet. They might live in mud huts and have to walk miles across mud fields to get to a meeting. By the time they showed up to that meeting, their tie would be on perfectly straight and their shoes would be polished to a perfect shine. They lived in a war zone, but they carried themselves with dignity and pride. And amidst that, we found war. So much war. We ended up sitting down with a number of the rebel groups in the region, sitting down and asking, why is this happening? What's going on? Who's funding you? Who's behind this? What's it going to take to stop it? This is the Mai Mai. They're, one of the, they're a movement of patriots. This man was abducted when he was nine. He's 19 in this photograph. And you can see there's not a trace of a child left in him. This man on my left is a man named Major Alexei. Major Alexei was 21 younger than many of you right here, when war broke out. And he went and fought for the side he thought was most patriotic. When he was 21, he was studying poetry and philosophy at the university. And for nine years, he's been in the jungle committing atrocious acts, burning villages and taking children and raping women. But when you sit down and have a coffee with him, 
He seems a lot like a university student who's studying poetry and philosophy. And at the time, this was six years ago, it was almost impossible to reach Major Alexei. But today I can text message him from here, from anywhere across the world. We can email one another from the jungle. And this is the power of what you guys are building. Uh, we'll be able to communicate in the most remote places, in the most remote ways, and have communication and dialogue in ways that we never had before in any other generation before this one. This boy had been tied up and beaten by a warlord named Nkunda. You can see the traces of the ropes on his arm. We asked this boy to draw what he had seen. He drew a tree on fire and a gun with blood coming out of it. This was General Nkunda. He was the deadliest warlord in the region for many years. And we found war. So much war. The largest UN peacekeeping force in the world. And a war that was fought over minerals. And here's the other big connection point. These minerals end up in all of our cell phones, computers, light bulbs, electricity of all kinds. That's what this war is being fought over, is all the minerals that make the modern world possible. We found a problem that felt so big and so impossible to solve, but we knew that it must be solved. And we knew that it was not a new problem, that it was in fact very, very old. This is me on my first day home, you know, with a mimosa to my right and friends and family around me. All I wanted was to see my friends and family and hug them and be thankful for them, the role that they had played in my life. What do you do? How do you even begin to respond to this problem? This war had claimed over six million lives. I didn't know what to do, so I just started writing. I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And friends would throw parties to welcome me home and I would just start screaming at people, right? Kids are dying, this is real. Six million people dead, a thousand women being raped every day. And it's happening right now in our midst, in our time, it's happening right now, it must be stopped. Eventually people stop inviting you back, right? Like who wants to hang out with the kid who's just screaming at them all the time? And so one of my best friends is a guy named Marcus. And Marcus came to me one night when I was just crying and screaming. And he came with an old vintage whistle. And he gave it to me as a gift. And he said, no matter where you go, keep these boys alive in your heart. Keep them at the forefront of this fight. Just a tiny little whistle. And all of a sudden, what happened was my conversations changed. I could go out and I didn't have to yell at anybody. Because everywhere I went, people would ask, what's the whistle? And I'd say, it's for peace in Congo. And they'd say, what's happening in Congo? And I'd say, the biggest war in the world. And, and you're not the activist who's yelling at people, like, do you care about women's rights? Do you care about the environment? And it's like, yeah, but not right now, right? Like, not, like, I'm just trying to get my groceries. I'm just trying to go about my day. All of a sudden, it was a dialogue. We were having a conversation. They were asking me the question. And we began thinking about what it means to be a whistleblower. What it means to speak up when everyone else is silent. When no one else is willing to say anything. This was our first office. We had a bucket. But we had internet. And we had computers. And we knew that we could reach the entire world if we decided to. That if we were smart enough and creative enough and clever enough. If we went hard enough. That we could tap into a network of young people around the planet who also cared about peace and justice and progress and the future and creating partnerships instead of enemies. And so we began. And we studied old whistleblowers, people who had said what needed to be said long before they knew answers or solutions. They said it because it needed to be said, because no one else had said it out loud. And by saying it out loud, they began a process that involved massive change that came after it. But the first step was saying it out loud. And we thought, what would it mean to say it out loud in the internet age? How do you begin a reverberation that spans the globe in a time when we can all hear one another and talk to one another, when we can all communicate? And so it became our symbol. 
our symbol of protest as we pursued solutions in a place where they were in short supply. We started saying, make their weapon your voice, be a whistleblower for peace. And people started wearing them. That was the crazy part. People wore them and they wore them. Everywhere we went, people would, we would sell them out of our pockets and then people found them online and they started buying them and we started seeing them everywhere we went. This symbol that allowed people to have new conversations in new ways. And so the Falling Whistles campaign was born, a campaign for peace in Congo. This was Dave. Dude, we had no money. We had $5 to start. $5 and we were in my friend's attic. We had nothing. And so we bought five whistles and we sold those out of our pockets and we had $50. And we sold more and we had $150. And Dave, he hitchhiked across America. He hitchhiked from Texas all the way to New York. And in every, living, every, in every living room and coffee shop, in every cafe and internet hub, he would sit down and he would look people in the, in the eyes and he would say, look, this problem is massive. We don't have answers, we don't have solutions, but six million people have died and we're not gonna be quiet till it's changed. Join us. And this was the thing, it was the first year that Twitter had come out. And so when he started in Texas, there were five, maybe 10 people. And by the time he got to the state next to it, Tennessee, there were 20 people. And when he got to Alabama, there were 50 people. And by the time he got to Florida next to that, there were 200 people. And as he went up, when we got to New York, there were 1,000 people at the event because he's tweeting it and tweeting it and people are tweeting it out and they're tweeting it out and it's moving and it's moving and it's moving. And this kid with no money and no power and very little information, just his phone and a passion began building this cultural movement a movement of young people. And he inspired three college students in Florida and they rode their bikes from Florida to California across the United States, sitting down in living rooms and coffee shops saying, look, we don't have all the answers, but six million people have died and we're not gonna be quiet until it's changed. And they're tweeting and they're tweeting and they're tweeting and it's moving and it's moving and it's moving. This was Marcus, he slept in an attic and he was our designer. He did all of our design, that's why we had a website. This was John, he moved out from Texas and he ran all the business for free. We were basically just surviving off of pasta and top ramen. This was our garage. We got desks from trash cans, we put them in the garage. And we just invited young people from across the country. We said, anyone who cares about this, come and work with us. And we would just sit at our computers and we would just reach out to every young person we could find across the country through music and through universities and through culture and through art and through design and through technology. And we would just reach out. Do you care about this? Do you care about this? Do you care about this? And the, co the co coalition began to form. Stuffing it with as many people as we could find. And so what we started doing was just selling the whistle with the original journal to show people why we had started to care. We started building these little cases with like rock filled grenade cases and we would take recycled materials from the street and we would build museums so that people could learn about it in an analog way. But they would learn about it in these retail stores and that would push them to the website. And so you're merging just like the whistle. You're having new communications physically, but those communications are pushing people online. And then the online communications are pushing people to physically meeting each other in the different cities. And then that's pushing more people online to learn more. And it was a cycle. And I think it's so important that as we get deeper and deeper into the online world and what is possible online, that we use it to create physical interactions. And then those physical interactions create more online interactions and back and forth and back and forth. And this is the way we build trust and relationships. And so we built these museums wherever we could go using all recycled materials. We built light boxes to illuminate these truths that have been held in shadows. And we started investing in entrepreneurs. All of you are entrepreneurs in one way or another. Yeah, you guys are all trying to build something. And so we found people in the war zone who were trying to build something, people our age. And we started working with them. What do you want to create? Oh, you want to create an internet cafe? Let's build that. You want to create a rehab center? Let's build that. You want to build a radio station? Let's build that. And so we started building young businesses with young Congolese entrepreneurs and sometimes they'd fail and sometimes they'd succeed. 
Sometimes the technology would work and sometimes it was a disaster. And we got better and we got better and we got better. We started forming a team, a team of young professionals who cared very deeply. This is Monique, she was 25, she was a lawyer, and she went to DC and started meeting with our leaders and saying, what are we gonna do about this? We have thousands of young people across the world who care about this, what are you gonna do? Demanding it of President Obama and of Congress. How are we gonna change this? This is Mario, he was our art director. He was my favorite graphic designer anywhere in the world. He was deeply anti-colonialism. And so his art was informed by a sentiment of anti-colonialism. His family was Spanish and Filipino, and he felt the pain of colonialism, and his art reflected that. And so we asked him to come, and he worked for nothing as we started to build, and we grew. Joey Rubin was a party promoter, and he was making parties in New York City, and just pulling people together for a good time. And we said, well, if you're throwing parties in New York, why don't we throw parties for peace? And so we had an organizer. And this was Sinclair, and Sinclair threw fashion events. And we were like, well, if you're gonna bring people for things that are sexy, why don't we just make peace sexy? And we'll bring people for that. And so he was on board and the team began to form. And this is Arnold. Arnold runs an underground network of activists throughout the war zone. And so when a woman went on the radio and she called out the local warlord and the local warlord said, there's a price on your head, we want you dead. Arnold was able to pull her underground, get her out of the country and then get her to Holland because he runs this underground railroad of activists. And they're using the best technology they can find, scraping it together, stealing electricity from the wires, you know, finding internet through different connections, using radio instead, anything they can find to communicate and to build the fabric of a communication network. This is Dr. Joe, he's a local surgeon. We funded hundreds of surgeons with, surgeries with him. This is Blaze, he's 27 years old in this photo. And Blaze used a local material and a local processing plant to treat 300,000 people for malaria. And we were able to invest in him and continue the communication because he had technology that wasn't available even five years ago. Sakombi has started the fastest growing radio in Congo. It's the first Congolese media brand. It's art and music and sex and politics and war, revolution. And he has young journalists coming together and sharing what's going on with their community. And it's the first time in a hundred years that Congolese people are talking to Congolese people about what's going on. Just hobbling together a radio station through broken technology. After three years of doing this, of trying things out and trying things out, we decided to launch a global campaign to get what's called a special envoy. Special envoy is the highest level diplomat in the world. And we wanted one at the US and at the UN and across the world. And so we did an online petition. It was very simple, just a digital petition. But we were able to pull together 77 organizations and 30,000 people became 50,000 people. And 20, 35 congressmen and 16 senators towards getting a special envoy. We got one at the UN and at the US. And so all of a sudden you had high level diplomats reporting directly to the heads of state about these problems because of an online petition. And then a year and a half ago, a rebel group called M23 invaded the city where many of our partners live and work. And there were 40 journalists hiding under their desks without food or water for three days. And the hospital was overrun and the children were scattered and hiding. And it was an emergency situation. And so we were having an event in New York and we all said, everyone stop, pull out your phones. We want you to tweet our ambassador to the UN right now, Ambassador Rice, tweet, stop M23. And so we, we wanted her to sanction the M23 leadership. So everyone tweeted her all at once. And we started getting ready with signs to like march on the UN and protest. And right then she tweeted us back and said M23 has been sanctioned. And we celebrated, right? We started high-fiving like, wow, this is a victory. And the next day we found out that it hadn't stopped anything. And so in 24 hours, we built a website called stopm23.com. It was very simple. 
and had the facts of what was going on. The city has been invaded. Thousands of people are being killed. Women are being raped. Children are being abducted. If you want to stop this, tweet right now and you could press a button and you would tweet directly to the ambassador. And over the next three weeks, there would be 60 million impressions on the website. Over 30,000 direct tweets directly at the ambassador. Every major newspaper in the Western world would cover the story. We would see $600 million in aid frozen to Rwanda. Congress quoted the website as they demanded that our State Department admit the truth behind Rwanda's involvement in the war for the first time in more than a decade. And ultimately, eight organizations would team up with a letter to the President of the United States, and the President of the United States would call the President of Rwanda and say, stop M23. And this is the power, guys. This is the power that we have on the internet, online, when we build good tools. We built this website in 24 hours. We built it fast. We built it using normal Squarespace. You know, simple, simple tools, simple coding. But because we were paying attention to the world around us, we were in touch with people around the world. We were able to react in real time as the emergency happened and within five weeks see that emergency pushed back. Four months later, M23's leader, Bosco, would surrender and he would end up in The Hague. And nine months later, Intel would announce the first conflict-free microprocessors in history. They'd, they, along with others, had invested over $100 million in creating conflict-free solutions so that we can get our technology conflict-free. It's not perfect, not at all, but it's an amazing start. And today, we're working with over 2,000 coffee farmers to get conflict-free coffee out of the country. So, what's the point? It's a big story, right? It's, a lot of things have happened in six years. And why does it matter? Because it wasn't possible 10 years ago. It wasn't even possible five years ago. These things have literally become possible year over year, and we've been able to use the new technology to demand new solutions. And every year the technology grows, we're able to demand better solutions. Every year more people get online, more people join the network, more people start talking to one another. You get better tools to translate information. More people can join to demand a freer world, a more peaceful world. And we've seen it. We've seen the progress in the deadliest place on the planet. We've seen more progress towards peace in four years than we've seen in decades before. Why? Because people united across the world and they had the internet as their tool. And so I know in some ways this can seem very far removed from what you're doing here, but I don't think it is at all. I think what you're doing is creating the future of how we interact, of how we talk, of how we share. And I think it's incredibly important. I don't know what the world looks like when Brazilian young people are talking to American young people every day. I don't know what that world looks like, but we could find out. We can build those tools. When Congolese young people are talking to Palestinian young people, Israeli young people are talking to Chinese young people, Chinese young people are talking to Brazilian young people, when we're all communicating about the world that we want to live in, what we want to buy and vote for and see happen in the world in terms of war and peace and justice and money. The amount of things that we could change in our lifetime, in just the next decade, is staggering. And I think far larger than anything that any generation before us could ever have seen change. And so I encourage you, continue to learn these tools, continue to understand everything about them, but use the tools, whether it's to change the local situation that you live in here or to team up with people around the world, use the tools to demand a world freer than our fathers. I want to show you one video and then we can do questions. Is there volume on the video?
Thanks, Herman. Um, in one month, Falling Whistles will move to Sweden. We've built local chapters all over the world. And those local chapters have organized their local communities and then pulled them together to see a global coalition built. And the most powerful local chapter was in Stockholm. And this organization was never about us. It was never about us controlling it. It was about giving the tools to the world. And so in one month, the organization will move to Stockholm and that local chapter will take over. And their job is going to be to build the tools online to connect the world. So we've created our first book. It's called The Free World Reader. It's here. It's 20, and I can't remember the name of the currency. 20, what is it? What is it? Hey, eyes? Yeah, it's 20. Um, I would love for you guys to have a coffee. This, is, this represents over 50 authors from around the world and 12 artists from t six countries. Um, it's a beautiful book. And it explains not just the deadliest war in the world, but how people across history have changed these problems. And how with new tools we could change them even more. Thank you guys for listening. I hope all of you will use these tools that you see in this room to be a whistleblower for peace. Thanks. Uma questions? Uma brita perguntas. É, se você quiser falar inglês, avisa antes para ele. Oh yeah. Doutor, alguém quer fazer uma pergunta? Uh, good evening, I'm Felipe. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your, pre on your impressive journey. It was really inspiring. And uh, I, I like to see things in a larger context, as, yeah. as you stated. Um, and I, I can't, I can't uh, see another way of thinking about it. Uh, as in, when, when you said your friend is against uh, colonialism. Yeah. And I couldn't think of another thing other than uh, that's exactly a consequence, direct consequence of capitalism. Yeah. And I, I, can't, uh, I can't avoid that. And um, if, if uh, there weren't a, l a, l a, large, uh, a, a large population uh, buying uh, our electronic stuff and everything, there wouldn't be uh, so much people looking for uh, those minerals in yeah. Congo, for example. Yeah. And companies in general, uh, especially the largest ones, as Walmart, for example, they don't, uh, they don't want us to know where, they, where the, the material comes from. Yes. And I, I'd like you to, to, to talk a little bit about, about, uh, about this consequence of capitalism, which is, in my opinion, and uh, that, that's it. What, what is the larger context for you? Yeah. Can, can, can we have a free world in capitalism? Yeah, it's a really important question. Can we give him a round of applause for a great question? Um, I, I, think, I, think it's a, I think it's a super important question. And I think if you look at capitalism, Congo is the most clear consequence. Right? I mean, the, and if you look at the world, the richest, most powerful country in the world is my country, it's America, and the poorest, deadliest country in the world is Congo. And everything else is sort of shades, right? Shades of gray within this larger context. So it's a good question. Can we have a free world inside of the current structure? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't even pretend to know. What I do know is that we live inside of the moment in history that we do live in and we can decide to solve problems or not, right? We can decide to like face them head on. And so while I think that the world needs massive overhaul of the economic system and of the political system and of the justice system and of the security system and all of those things, I also know that I am not the person right now to solve those things. I don't understand them well enough, but I do understand how to get goods from Congo, conflict-free. You know, I do know how to do that. We've, learned, we've spent five years learning how to do that. How to get them through the process of the, the shipping and the packaging and the broker and the comptoir and the transfer and get them out without interfering with rebels or child soldiers or raped women or any of those things. And I do know that when that happens, we create jobs and that when that happens, less and less people need to be a part of the war and more people begin to rebuild their country. 
My hope is that capitalism allows us to have the mechanics to all talk to one another, you know, to all share with one another, to have real-time translation on Twitter so that I can tweet and you immediately can read it in Portuguese. And you can tweet and I can immediately read it in English, right? And that we can do that with Arabic and with Hebrew and, with, and on and on and on. My hope is that capitalism gives us that mechanics. And then once we have those mechanics, that as a world we get to begin making the very serious reforms necessary to change that system. So I wish I had a better answer for you. You know, but I think right now for me it's let's, let's end this war. And, and while doing that, while ending this war and creating peace in this place that is so challenging, let's show the world that we can solve big problems. Right? We really can. That when we work together, that we can solve things that the last generation thought was impossible to solve. And if we believe that, then maybe we can solve things like the consequences of capitalism. Yeah. Uh, in English. Oh, okay. I would like to know if you guys are trying to stop Joseph Coney. Yeah, it's a good Because question. Because I read on a, I read on the internet yeah. that he's one of the most dangerous generals. Yeah. In Congo, so I'm, I really like to know about it. Yeah. Um, so there's a. You know about Coney 2012, yeah, the video and the campaign. So that was run by an organization called Invisible Children. Um, and Invisible Children has been working for 10 years to stop Joseph Kony. And Joseph Kony has now left northern Uganda and he is in northern Congo or southern Central African Republic. We don't quite know, you know, because he moves back. It's jungle. And so he moves back and forth. Um, they've done an incredible job of reaching the world with the importance of this issue, you know, of, of reaching millions and millions of people and of channeling that to demand solutions from leaders. It is not the priority for us. When I think about the larger problems of Congo, the thing that has led to 6.9 million people de being dead and the rape and all of those things, I think a great deal about the economic realities with the mineral trade. I think a lot about the lack of peacekeeping force In, the, in, the, in, the, in that region. Um, I think a lot about the lack of, it's called impunity, right? Where there's no consequences for negative action. And so that's what I'm focused on and that's what we're focused on is creating jobs that are conflict-free, creating exports that are conflict-free, demanding more effective peacekeeping and demanding reform in the justice system, right? Because I think that's ultimately what ends the war in Congo at large. And if you end the war in Congo at large, then somebody like Kony can't just hide out, right? Um, he can't just like have safe haven in the jungle. And, and so that's what we've been focused on. Yeah. Um, good evening. Good evening. Uh, so uh, I think that here in Brazil, in North Brazil, we have uh, another kind of war. Yeah. It's like... Uh, Uh, the word that we live in is drug dealing, you know? It's what? Drug dealing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and my, and my, and my, and my um, born, my born, my bird place where I live, I lost friends yeah. that played with me as a child for drug dealing. Yeah. Uh, neighbors, friends of 15 years old, 17 years old, uh, 21 years old, all of them are leaders of drug dealing, you know? And I think that I did, I, in a little context, I can use this, use your, your type of uh, approach to the problem to solve this uh, beyond communication, beyond all, this, all these tools that, do you think that uh, education, do you think that, uh, I don't know what I'm going to say, the kind of education can help also, can help this to solve this problem, you know, in my community, my little place? Do you think that this, this can help? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I grew up on the border of San Diego and Mexico, right, where, where it's, it's, a, it's a portal for drug trade as well, and heavy, heavy gang violence. And so, although it's very different, 
the drug trade from Mexico to America and from America, you know, is there, it's creates its own war as well, right? So there's not just wars in Congo and wars, there's war everywhere at some level. There's violence everywhere. And, and we, have, we have ways of dealing with it that are effective and ways that are not. And so my intention is not to suggest that this is the most important thing in the world and nothing else is important, right? My intention is simply to focus on something, to, to ask other people to focus on it, to show what's possible in the modern age when people do give it talent and energy and creativity and intelligence and intention and money and all of those things, right, to solving something in the hopes that hundreds of millions and billions of others around the world will do the same in their own way, in their own place, right? And so, yes, is, that, is education a part of the solution? 100%. That's why we made the book. It's why we build all the tools that we built online. It's why we've made the videos. It's why I lecture in places like this, why I'm flying down here, right? Is to educate people and show them how it's done, what we've learned at least from our experience. Um, and, and, and why we've invested in Congo in rehabilitation. Um, in language training, in radio, to create better f tools of getting information out. Um, and so I'm a deep believer in education. I'm also a deep believer in the power of jobs. You know, when people have something to do with their day that is constructive, that's beneficial, they can come home and feed their families. You know, they can take care of the people around them. It gives them value and purpose and meaning in life. And, and all of a sudden, you have less inclination to go and create violence, right? Um, I'm a big believer in partnership and what these things can do across the world when we're actually talking with one another so we don't feel isolated, we don't feel cut off from each other. That's why I flew down because I don't know anything about internet culture in Brazil, right? Like I am totally ignorant and that's why I'm here is to learn and to listen and to share. Um, so I'm a big believer in the power of education, for sure. Yeah. Thank you, totally. Uh, Good evening. Yeah. Uh, hey. uh, meu nome é Ademir. Uh, e a primeira vez que eu participo do Campus Party. Sorry. Good evening. Go ahead. Ok. O uh, meu nome é Ademir. A primeira vez que eu participo do Campus Party e uh, eu me surpreendi hoje, né, com esse nível, com essa sua palestra e parabenizo você em trazer uma filosofia e um desejo importante né, a nível social. tá? É, saindo do Congo e vindo para Recife e vindo para o Brasil, nós somos detentores de informações, detentores de conhecimento, vários profissionais aqui, é, pessoas que estão na universidade, pessoas que estão terminando mestrado, doutorado, enfim, trabalham como assessores, trabalham como profissionais na área de tecnologia e próximo de cada um de nós temos pessoas né, nessa vulnerabilidade social precis, precisando desse empreendimento que foi abordado aqui. Né? Então, é, quando a gente coloca e visualiza a pirâmide social, a gente vê que é, essa rede que foi apresentada do Congo está perto da gente, está perto de cada um de nós e, e, e é preciso é, fazermos uma auto-reflexão né, e ver a possibilidade de juntar essas ferramentas tecnológicas para ajudar e para tirar um pouco, usando uma filosofia que quase é utópica, mas não é, é possível porque você internalizou o seu desejo e foi buscar parcerias, parcerias de amigos, parcerias de parentes, e isso é preciso fazer essa auto-reflexão em nós detentores também de conhecimento para que nós compartilhemos essa grande rede né, para tratar esse lado humano que é primordial. Mais uma vez, parabéns. Tá? E até a próxima. I think I think you said it you said it as well as I could say it. You know, you said it you said it perfect. Um, we we live in a challenging world. You know, and and Falling Whistles has made an enormous amount of mistakes. Right? We've 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 made just as many mistakes as we've had successes. But that's the process. Right? Great technology is built from prototyping. You know, you prototype and you prototype and you prototype and it doesn't work and it doesn't work and it doesn't work, but then it does. And I think the same is true with solving our social problems, our political problems, our security problems. You prototype. 
You know, you, you, you can't be afraid of the failure and of the ridicule and of the way that people won't believe in you and, and, and all of those things. Because the future is a very different place than the past. You know, there, it's dramatically larger in its realm of possibility. And, and so, you know, in the end, that is, that is my deepest hope. Uh, is that our generation would take a hold of that possibility, that we would grab it and use it. Hello. Here, Sean. Yeah. Thanks for such a nice talk. Uh, still on the, you, you mentioned a lo uh, little bit about the mistakes now that you committed, but I would like to learn more about how, which were the biggest challenges you yeah. faced on establishing a position in Congo? Because I understand you might have some kind of pushback, maybe yeah. from the government, even from the government, especially from the rebels, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I, I would like just, of course, it's a huge history, but what, what could you share with us? I think one of the best lessons from what we've done um, came with, I mentioned that woman, Monique, and Monique, was a, she was a young human rights lawyer. She was 25 years old when we first met. And Monique cared very deeply about what was happening in Congo. She had a big brain, um, but she was untried. You know, as a lot of, uh, those of you who are 25, like, you know, you're smart and you're capable and you know how to get things done, but maybe you haven't had your shot, you know, to really go out and show the world what you can do. And so what we said to Monique was we said, we're gonna pay you for 12 months. We're going to pay you a small salary, but you will, have, you will have money for 12 full months. And we want you to do nothing but ask questions. We want you to ask questions of everyone. Political leaders, corporate leaders, activists, underground activists, NGOs, aid workers, academics, internet activists, on and on and on and on and on, right? We just want you to do nothing for 12 months but ask questions. And so she had hundreds of meetings. And at the end of that year, we built a mind map where we took all the people and we put it all on a wall, all these different faces from all over the world and that represented all these interests. And we started drawing lines. Oh, this money's coming from there and that money's coming from there and this person's in charge of that and this person's behind that. And we started creating this mind map. And when we created that mind map, that was how we began to realize that the way to unite people was in demanding a special envoy be appointed. Um, and that special envoy push, like I said, originally it was 30,000, then 50,000 people, 35 congressmen, 16 senators, and 77 organizations ultimately came together to demand the special envoy. But we only figured out that solution by doing a full year of research. And I think the same is true with a lot of great technology, with a lot of great political movements, with solving local problems. Especially when we're young, I think we want to jump in and just get to work, you know? And sometimes, you know, like a fist, it's like the further you pull back, the harder you punch, or like a bow and arrow, right? The more you pull back, the faster it flies. I think a lot of times with business and enterprise and movement and change, the same is true. You have to pull all the way back and see it clearly in order to strike and strike in a way that is surgical and actually ex gets the job done. Um, and so that's my greatest lesson. You know, I think that, that the community of people that we met with, they hated each other. You know, it's a, it's a war, right? So everybody hates each other. Everybody's enemies with everybody. And everybody, they did it wrong, and they did it wrong, and they're doing it wrong, and they're doing it wrong, and everyone wants to point fingers. And so it took a full 12 months to sort of look at that and say, well, how can we unite people? And that, I think, is, is, is you know, your, your largest challenge across the board. As we, have the, as we have better and better tools, more people will have more opinions, right? More people will have more problems that are happening locally that they think are the most important thing, more grievances, more perspectives, and it's gonna be harder and harder to unite people. But I do think that if we do the work of sitting down and building relationships and having conversations and hearing people out and sharing with one another, that we can unite people across oceans and cultures and borders and wars. Because I do think that, just like with the five boys, when we share our stories, you know, and you get all the way down, we want the same things. You know, we want to live our lives with peace 
We want to have fun with our family and laugh. We want to enjoy our friends. We want to like, pursue beauty and art and creativity. We want to use our talents to the best of our ability. Around the world, we want the same things. And so I think taking that time to pull back and find what unites people is, is critically important. Yeah. Go for it, yeah. Do we have a mic? Hello. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Boa noite. Um, na época da, do imperialismo ali, o Congo belga já teve morte de 10 milhões de pessoas, que foi denunciado justamente pela presença de missionários na época, missionários que estavam no país na época. Hoje, na atualidade, você está realizando o mesmo, mesmo tipo de, de, de ação, de certa forma, de denúncia, de mobilização social. E o que você pode comentar para a gente sobre a presença da ONU nesse continente, que há tanto tempo está ali com missão de paz e não conseguiu fazer o que você fez em muito pouco tempo, é, mobilizando pessoas através de, de uma ação que é de divulgação realmente. O que você pode comentar para a gente sobre a presença da ONU ali no Congo? Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, the UN is it's it's very challenging. Go ahead. Um, the United Nations is very challenging, as we know, right? Uh, and, you know, incredibly necessary on the one hand and incredibly ineffective on the other hand. It's a very challenging institution. And I think what, what has happened over the last two years that's been so significant is the UN took a chance and they appointed the first offensive peacekeeping force in the world. So these are peacekeepers who have a mandate to do whatever is necessary to remove rebels from the battlefield. So they're essentially peacekeepers who are going to war. And it's a very risky thing. You know, this is not an easy, th there was a ton of controversy around it. But in the end, there was so much pressure from the world demanding peace that the UN had to try something new. And I think what I'm proud of is that the UN is trying a prototype you know, and it may not work. It may not get us all the way there, but it's a prototype. And, we, and it, they, that offensive peacekeeping force stopped M23. You know, they stopped them and, and they, uh, they were able to arrest 2,000 soldiers. And it doesn't mean it's over forever, but it's a massive victory for peacekeeping in the world. And, and, and I think we need more prototypes in the international affairs. I think that the way that politics works could learn so much from how you guys work. You know, if you're building technology and you're trying new things and you're taking tools from there and you're learning lessons from there and you're talking to people here and pulling it together and making it and trying new things, I think that's how the international community should be working right now because we don't have answers to our problems. You know, we don't know. We think we know, but it's, it's nonsense because it's a new world all the time. And so I'm proud that the UN took a chance. And I think that the UN will take more chances if the people of the world will push. You know, if we'll demand more from them, um, I think the UN will take more chances. I think that's a good thing. I, I think we need a, a, a more risk-taking United Nations um, to try and solve these problems. Oh, well, I want to do one more, and then we, yeah. Oi, é, pessoal, tá muito boa a palestra, mas agora vamos para a última pergunta, tá ok? É, First of all, I, I don't want to, I, I don't have anything to say about you, ask about you, to you, but I just have to, to thank you for your speech. I, yeah. I really love it to, to hear. Uh, but I just have one thing to say uh, for my all uh, mates that are here, that there is one platform or uh, a method that uh, was created by uh, the human-centered design, that's its design thinking, and I think it's very whole, uh, very good for each one who, who wants to use it, uh, make things to help people, that uh, provide us uh, many of, of tools, many of uh, ways that we can, uh, we, we can organize our, our thinking, our, our thoughts, and make it on a on a platform. Yeah. Uh, I I have a friend of mine 
that he, he created a platform in the internet that's that's called uh, how we can do, but in Portuguese, é como podemos. E uh, it's a, a good that it's a platform that makes us to ask how we can do, how we can fix uh, the 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 problem of that uh, place, that square, that have garbage and people are throwing garbage there, and it's very good. But he he lives in in the city that is the the dangerous city. Uh, I don't I don't think if it's in the world that Simões Filho so in La Bahia that has the the biggest uh, taxes of of homicides. Mm. I I probably there are many places in the world that have the, the same taxes but uh, don't are mentioned but there are many home sites and he he took that challenge and decided to create something and the, he used this this method that uh, HCG in everyone can go at Google and find it and download it and read it because it's very useful for for doing things yeah yeah, I think, um, you know, we're big fans of human-centered design and, and the design style thinking that was pioneered by IDEO, right? And IDEO invented the mouse for Apple. IDEO has been one of our great mentors. Um, they, have, they have really ushered us and taught us and, and, and created our understanding of how to solve these problems since the very beginning. We're very fortunate to work with them. We built with them a system for. I'm um, oh, sorry. We built with IDEO a system for um, real-time election monitoring. It was a really simple system. It was basically where anyone with a cell phone could, if they were during election day, if they saw signs of corruption, coercion, or violence, they could report those signs to the radio station. The radio station would put them online for the world to see and then would report them to peacekeepers so peacekeepers could respond. And so in this place that had very little technology, basically text messaging and radio, what we did was we created a situation where everyone could be an election monitor, right? All the citizens could be an election monitor. And that was with IDEO um, because they came in and they're like, all right, well, we don't have the technology, we don't have the infrastructure, but we got people. So how do we design something using the people that can solve this problem? And, and, and there are four principles, and this will be the last thing I say, but they had four principles that I think are super important. The first is rapid prototyping. Prototype, 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 build new things. The second thing is fail cheap, fail early, fail often. And we've done that very much with Falling Whistles. It's like try things, screw it up, and then learn from it and get better over and over and over again. The third is a bias towards ignorance. And this is, I think, the biggest one, is that if you are ignorant about how to solve a problem, if you are young and naive, and then there are all these people who are experts, right, the sort of professionals on how to solve the problem, chances are that the experts became experts while the problem got worse. And what that means is that your ignorance, your naivety, and your youth are at least as valuable to solving the problem as their expertise. And so I really value youth and, and, and the idea that like, oh, you haven't done something before? Oh, we haven't ended wars before? Oh, we haven't seen peace in Congo before? Perfect. That's exactly what you need in order to solve something, right, is new eyes. Um, and that's part of why I'm here as well. Um, so I'm a big believer in human-centered design. And, and, and I think that we can learn a lot from it. If we take it from technology and into the real world, and then from the real world and back into our technology. Um, thank you again for listening. It's been an honor. Peace.